When I use the phrase, the spirit of faith, what comes to mind? What do you first think of when I say the spirit of faith? What comes to mind? Is there such a thing as a spirit of skepticism? Have any of you ever been around people or maybe you went to a church that their default position was skepticism? It's better, I believe, to be amongst people whose default is, I believe God. Say that out loud with me. I believe God. There used to be a simple expression, Jesus said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, that's good. I mean, sometimes things are a little more complicated than that, but that's a good place to start. The place where you choose to believe God. After all, the spirit of faith will be manifest and the spirit of skepticism will be manifested. We can see the fruit of it in our lives. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 13. 2 Corinthians 4:13. <clears throat> Paul was talking about his um, challenging and difficult life as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostles, those that are called by God to pioneer new territories or take on deeply entrenched powers or false beliefs, they often are attacked and uh, buffeted and go through various trials. And Paul was exceptional in that uh, he suffered a great deal for the work of God. And as he described all of that here in 2 Corinthians 4, he comes down to verse 13. But, in other words, in contrast to all the hardship, but having the same spirit of faith according to what is written. I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. And then he starts the next verse with the word knowing. You know, there is a power inside the human spirit to know when God speaks. And when God speaks, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't impart fear or doubt or he doesn't inflate your carnal ego. He speaks truth. He's a realist. But when God speaks, you know it in your knower. Now, I don't know how to explain that, but I know that it works. You can know things up here in your head by information you took in. But you also can know things down in your heart in your inner man, in your spirit, by things the Holy Spirit bears witness to. Have any of you ever experienced that, where you knew it in your heart, even before you could figure it out in your head? That's why we need to study the Bible, because a lot of times God will show you things or deal with you or be teaching you something, and He's dealing with your heart, and then later you get it out of the Bible, and it it confirms in your head what you already knew down in your heart. People are born again, born of the Spirit of God, before they fully understand everything that God did for us through Christ on the cross. I know that I was born again and even baptized in the Holy Spirit as a child before I completely, uh, I had no way of understanding everything the Bible had to say about it. But it was a reality, and in my heart I knew it was true. We, I knew it in my knower. And I want to talk about the spirit of faith, not just the doctrine of faith, because the spirit of faith will give you a capacity to understand and hear God's Word out of the Scriptures in a way that will strengthen you and cause you to be more effective for Him. He said, we having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, we do know that what's written comes out, uh, will give to us a spirit of faith. 
God's Spirit always imparts faith. We were in the men's group, we were reading through the book of John, and we came to John 20, verse 31. And I love this particular verse. These verses are in your notes, and I'll read it to you. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. When you believe the Word of God, whether it's preached or read, something connects you to God. Faith connects you to God. Faith enables you to have a relationship with God. We walk by faith. We know God by faith. We believe in God by faith. Faith is the ultimate currency, golden currency in the kingdom of God. Faith enables you to tap into a relationship with Jesus. When you believe the Bible, when you read the Bible, read it with faith. Say, Lord, speak to me through this word. I so, I so get angry with so-called Bible teachers that their sole purpose seems to be to undo people's faith in the Bible. That is very sad. It's treachery in the kingdom of God to do that. The Word of God is true. I've been around studying the Bible all of my life. I've got several different translations. I love the New American Standard Bible, though I cut my teeth memorizing the King James Version with all of its these and thous, and uh, some of its old English that was hard to understand, but it was precious to me. And all of the Bible translations we have in our modern era in English are really wonderful and very good. I'll use all of them eventually, going from one to the other. I'll go back for word study to my New American Standard. Me and Tony both have that in common. We love this particular translation of the Bible. But the Word of God produces faith in God. And people that teach you to doubt the Bible are betraying their walk with God. And any Bible teacher that teaches you to doubt the Word of God, you ought to get away from them as quickly as you can. And to those of you that are listening online, if you go to a church where the Word of God isn't honored or taught, if all they do is do book reports in church, you're in the wrong church. You need to get fed the Word of God. That's the purpose of gathering for us to grow in the faith and in the knowledge of the Lord and minister one to another. Amen? Amen. Let's go to another scripture. Well, so all of these scriptures together are going to give you a picture about the spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 makes this simple statement. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith sees an invisible spiritual reality. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith apprehends something before you can even see it. Faith lays hold of something before you even can feel it. I remember my illustration a few weeks back about the green mercury with air conditioning in a big trunk. I had that car before I ever had that car because I'd prayed for it and claimed it in faith in a time of prayer. And the Lord had asked me what color, and I said green, and, and He said what kind? I said, well, mercury with cold air conditioning and a big trunk. And that's exactly what He gave me. You can claim something by faith before you even see it. And if you see it with the eyes of your spirit, it's even easier to claim. I really recommend praying when you're in a time of prayer and praise and anointing when the Holy Spirit's present to guide you. It's so much easier to pray that way. I know that we as a church are praying for property, and part of this I'm on hold for a later time because we as a church are going to come together agreeing in prayer. We need property. And I was given just a couple of weeks ago the spirit of faith to pray for property. It's one thing to pray out of a wish list. It's another to pray knowing God wants you to pray. And all of a sudden, and I won't give that testimony today, but all of a sudden I got a download of faith for property. God wants our church to have property 
because the work we are doing here and around the world is going to continue into the next generation. And it requires a base of operations and the stability that comes with owning property. You say, yeah, but property is so expensive here. You just uh, invited a spirit of doubt and skepticism to come into your own heart. You know what? God is not broke. <laughs> and there's plenty of money in the world. It just is in the hands of the wrong people. I was reading in my Bible just yesterday how when God first began to call Abraham, it made this little statement in one verse, and Abraham was very wealthy with gold and silver and cattle and sheep. When God calls somebody and his destiny and purpose for their life requires it, he will equip you and fund you and provide for you in a way commensurate with the calling that's on your life. Yes. Your calling may not require extravagant funding. But if your calling does, our God is well able to supply everything that you need. And in my Bible, God plans a long time ahead to, to dispossess idolaters and to give land to his covenant people that fear him and obey him. It is no challenge to the Lord to dispossess owners of businesses, properties, or those that think they're entitled to political power. It is no challenge to God with one flick of a finger or commissioning of an angel to cause them to lose everything they've got. It is not hard for God. What is challenging is for God's people to believe that God will do it. Mm, okay. Sometimes the word cuts and plows before it plants and waters. Amen? For we walk by faith, not by sight. Whatever you want to possess from God, if you can possess it by faith, you can have it. Faith obtains the answer before you see it, before you feel it, before it's in your hand. Now, there is a battle going on over faith, and the devil will do everything he can to keep us from walking in faith. And by the way, we often think in our American hyper-individualism, of faith being just something between me and Jesus. And I hope you'll understand by the time I'm through that it's not that way all the time. Often faith is a team effort. There is a corporate sense of faith that sustains us when we personally are being buffeted or feel weak in faith. There is a strengthening that comes to faith when two or three agree together as touching something in the Lord. There is an empowerment that comes to faith when we pray for one another and when we loan our faith and team up in our faith and get in a yoke with others in our faith, faith increases. I'll show you in a minute. There is the spirit of faith that can come on a whole community. Luke 18, verse 8, Jesus simply made this little comment when talking about the end of the age. He said, nevertheless, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find his kind of faith, God's kind of faith? Faith is so important. It's such a big theme. Abraham was justified by faith, made righteous. Believers in Jesus walk in his steps, in the steps of Father Abraham. We also become believers in God and find salvation. Real faith will impact your heart, not just your head. And a lot of people have a faith in the head that needs to drop down about a foot and lodge inside an internal organ, the capacitor that God gave you to carry the spirit of faith. 
it's not in your head, it's in your heart. And the reason why it's difficult sometimes to have faith is because your heart's not right. If you carry a hardened heart, hardened or embittered by sin or resentment or, or harboring disappointments or even accusations against God, which is more common than you realize, you need to get that right and repent and get before God and get a tender heart because when you've got a tender heart, you've got a receptacle here that now the Spirit of God can deposit His faith into. Amen. Amen. I need that amen bucket again this morning. I need a little bucket over there and go get an amen when I need one. Faith is preceded by repentance. The preaching of the New Testament was repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the basic part of our faith. We need a change of heart and a change of thinking that comes when we have faith in God. And God's Word can produce faith in you that you didn't have before. And here's some good news. If you need faith, you can get it. It's available. God isn't stingy about giving faith to His people. He wants you to have faith. I've proven in my own life that when I was down, when I was in distress, when I was challenged, when I didn't know which way to turn, if I sought God, I could find help from God. I could discover He was available to me. As a young person, I went to prayer. I closed my bedroom door. I sought the Lord. I found the Holy Spirit real in my life. He came and He gave me His faith. As an 18-year-old, I raised the money and went down into the Caribbean islands preaching the gospel all by myself, nobody with me, because I had faith I could do it. Now, there's different kinds of faith. There's natural faith and there's spiritual faith. I'm going to try and tell you a little bit of distinction between those two. There's a difference between saving faith and the gift of faith. Saving faith is what happens when you hear the gospel and God by His grace opens your heart and you believe and receive Christ. Saving faith is produced. That's available to whosoever will. Whoever wants to can come to the Lord. And saving grace is available to them if they'll hear the gospel and believe it and turn to the Lord. Amen? That's what happens when we testify and share Jesus with people. God touches their heart. And when we tell them the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for them and was raised again from the dead, and He is Lord, and you can receive Him right now, saving faith can come into their heart and life, and they can be transformed in a moment. That's saving faith. But then there's such a thing as the gift of faith. It's not saving faith. It's beyond that. Saving faith gets you to heaven. The gift of faith can empower you to rescue other people. The gift of faith can empower you to succeed in life in endeavors you might have been afraid to get into. The gift of faith can open up doors for you you had no idea you could go through. The gift of faith will give you courage when everybody else is full of fear. The gift of faith is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that's available to us today. We don't often hear about it, but it's a reality. And the gift of faith sometimes operates through prophecy. When people stand up and give a word from God, faith can be imparted to that whole people group at once. <laughs> when Moses was leading Israel out into, away from Egypt and across the Jordan River, I mean the, the Red Sea, and the staff, he, he stood there, I can just picture a uh, in that great old Cecil B. DeMille movie of, uh, of Moses and the Exodus, he said, stand still and see the salvation of God. Faith came to the people of God. Faith came to the people of God. When Jehoshaphat was going to battle against a great army that was coming against them, and they had sought the Lord with prayers and entreaty, and the leaders of the nation humbled themselves, and the Spirit of God came upon one particular man, and he said, the Lord will fight for you. Faith came to the people of God. Faith can be imparted through the gift of prophecy. When God speaks a word of faith, Faith is now available if you'll hear it and believe it. Sometimes 
There are places and critical moments when you don't need to understand everything. All you need to do is agree with the word God just said. That's it. Just simply say amen to the word God just said. And something shifts when we come into agreement with the word of God. Individual faith versus corporate faith. There is such a thing. Jesus went into a little village in Mark chapter 6 into a town and it says he could there do no mighty miracles except he healed a few sick people. Jesus, the Son of God, was limited. Yep. He couldn't do any signs and wonders. He just got a few sick people healed. Friends, I hate to tell you this, but even among most Pentecostal churches, Spirit-filled charismatic churches that claim to believe in and, and possess spiritual gifts, it's unusual to get any healings. Why? It's not like that overseas. It's like that here in America. The reason is higher criticism and higher education has taught people to doubt the Word of God, to disdain the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or to say those things were done away with, and so a spirit of skepticism is the default position, and that atmosphere of doubt permeates the whole gathering and the whole body of believers. I remember one prophet going into a meeting one Sunday, and he asked the Lord, Lord, are you doing anything here today? And the Lord said, no, and don't you try anything either. <laughs> if the anointing isn't there, and the and the faith to receive it isn't there, it's a futile effort to try and make it happen. That's just my practical experience about things. We are growing as a body of believers in faith. We're growing in faith. We're learning that God loves us individually, and He loves us collectively. That God is training and teaching and equipping each of us as a, as a person, but He is also fitting us together. And the being fit together, I love that word Lisa brought about being fit together. That being fit, fitted together isn't just to fit in, it's to fit together. And I'll add to it, and being fit together so we can function together. Because when we operate as a team in unity, greater power, greater results will occur. Amen? We're stronger together than we are when we're alone. One of the great things and great mysteries that God has hidden as we are steeped in our hyper-individualism and, and our isolationism and just me and Jesusism theology, one of the great things that God is going to unveil to us is the power, the mystery, the great miracle-working capacity of a body of believers that will dare to believe God together. When we recognize our membership in one another, when we will love each other enough to tell each other the truth and not be offended and say, well, I won't go there anymore. They hurt my feelings. You know what? Some of you need to get your feelings hurt because that's the only way you'll get real enough about what's going on in your life to get to the foot of the cross and get saved all over again. Ooh, that felt good to say that. Wow. <laughs> Now, I major on the mercy of God because I need mercy myself. But I want to tell you, it's not there, there, you'll be okay. That doesn't sanctify you. The Word of God will sanctify you, whether it's from the pages of the Bible or a brother or sister that loves you enough to confront you. Let's get real. We need each other. I've lost track of the number of times my wife told me the truth in a way I didn't want to hear. Sweet Lena. Somebody once said, she's nicer than God. <laughs> I can testify, no, she's not. <laughs> we need people that we know love us and care for us enough to tell us the truth. I've started doing that with a handful of people. And it's not easy because I like to be liked. 
but for just for a moment there's the risk of the relationship if you know that it's God's word to them and they need to hear it there's a risk when you speak the truth in love isn't there you parents you moms and dads every time you say to your kids you can't behave that way in this house you're risking them not liking you for a few minutes but hopefully that word of correction will bring the peaceable fruit of righteousness, won't it? You know why a father corrects us? So we can get up off the floor where we're making a mess and sit at the table and fellowship with him. Amen? Communities can develop greater faith together. We move from skepticism to expectancy. We move from saying, God never does that around here, to where we start hearing testimonies and seeing reports where things in the Bible start coming alive. And all of a sudden, we shift into an expectant attitude rather than the default of skepticism. Expectancy is another way to define faith. Now let me give you a little bit of my pastoral wisdom here. Why pray about something if you don't expect it to happen? Don't just be religious and go through the motions. If you don't have faith for it, confess that that's the reality of your life at that moment. See, because maybe right now, today, this moment, you don't have faith, but I want to tell you, you can get faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. When people got around Jesus and believed in him and worshiped him, they were given the faith they needed to obtain the miracle that was required. If you need faith for property, for finances, for business, for education, for ministry, for operating spiritual gifts, for requesting of God a petition for our corporate needs for property, or for the next generation to be effectively equipped for ministry, God can give you faith for that if you don't presently have it. Faith comes by grace. In fact, let me go down to one of my verses in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Faith comes by grace. Faith is a gift from God. You know, we need a stronger theology of gifts, don't we? God is a giver. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God the Father gave His Son Jesus. Jesus loves us so much, He gave us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves us so much, He gives all these diversity of, of gifts, at least nine of them. God's a giver. If you love somebody, you give things to them. It's by grace. You see, if you think you earned it, then it didn't come by grace. In Romans chapter 12, there's another scripture that talks about grace. He says, and this, it's uh, talking about prophecy and then motivational gifts for serving in the body of Christ. Uh, people that can't serve, that can't take the low seat and quietly without anybody noticing, serve others, they don't have much grace. Grace from God will enable you to be generous. It will enable you to be loyal and faithful. Grace from God will enable you to serve others, even when there's no immediate reward to you. Romans 12, verse 3 says, For by the grace given to me. See, grace is always given. Always given. Say it out loud with me. Grace is always given. Where do you get grace? From God. Come boldly to the throne of grace. 
God's very throne is called grace. He rules from a position of grace. We come to that throne of grace so that we can obtain help. He said, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith. Whoa, 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 whoa. Faith has a measurement? Yeah. Sometimes people have little faith. Sometimes people have great faith. And I want to tell you a little clue about myself. On some days I have more faith than other days. I'm just, I'm just weak. I need God's presence and His Word in me. I need to spend time with the Lord. Then my faith grows stronger. So we have a measure of faith. And the measure of faith that you have is different from the measure of faith somebody else has. My wife has faith she can play the piano even though she cannot read music. To me, that's a walking miracle right there. To believe you can do that on a keyboard. And I have faith that if I seek the Lord, initially, ultimately, finally, God will speak to me. I have faith for that. And I've had faith at times to believe God would use me to speak prophetically to people. And that's very scary sometimes. But it says we have a measure of faith that God has assigned. He assigns certain degrees of faith and kinds of faith to different people for His kingdom's sake. And sometimes the faith you've been assigned is not for your own benefit. When Gordon discovered that God could use him to heal the sick, it wasn't for his benefit. Sometimes ministers of healing carrying that anointing to deliver and to work miracles are themselves afflicted but don't get healed. I can't explain that. But like one miracle evangelist that I was mentored by, he said, the gifts are not for me, they're for the people. Gifts of faith are mysterious, but often they operate in you not for your own benefit or selfish purposes, but for the benefit and for the sake of those around you. Did you understand? Are you with me on that so far? God assigns them, for as in one body we have many members. Boy, the Lord was having me emphasize our membership in the body while we were partaking of uh, the Lord's table this morning. He says here in Romans 12, for as in one body we have many members. For as in one body, how many bodies are there? One. How many members are there? Many. That's why we need to discern the body. Now look, there are many gatherings of the body of Christ in this region. The Holy Spirit assigns people in certain gatherings or bodies for His purpose to be done, and for you to be blessed and equipped. He assigns you to a place, and when you find your fit, there you can function. Isn't that wonderful? When Lane and I walked into this church, we weren't looking for a church. But we discovered quite to our surprise, Holy Spirit, who knows the will of God, even when we don't. He had found an assigned place for us. And I'm so grateful that we found our assigned place. Now, you may not be so happy about it, but I'm here and I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> I mean, in my mind, Lena knows I was frustrated, retired, unfulfilled, unhappy. <laughs> Ain't nothing worse than a preacher. Don't have no place to preach. <laughs> I started off preaching on the street corners of Lakeland, Florida. I didn't have a place to preach. I found out at the bus station that I could get a new audience every 10 minutes. <laughs> They'd rotate through getting off one bus, waiting at the depot to get on another bus. And I would stand up there with a flagpole 
and a, an American flag and a Christian flag, and I was preaching the gospel, and, uh, and I had a, ro- a rotating audience. It's odd, it's still about the same today. People can only tolerate me about 10 minutes. <laughs> I wish I could get that solved. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Now, I don't like that. Because some of you, it's not easy to be a member with you. (laughs) That's all right. Go ahead and laugh. I know who you are. (laughs) You know what? It's like marriage. God throws a man and a woman into a room, locks the door behind them, and says, don't come out till you love each other. (laughs) That's covenant. That's commitment. That's how the kingdom of God operates. You don't have to always like the people God teams you up with, but God has teamed you up with those people for a reason, because you need it or they need it. God will bless you or afflict you with people according to your need. Isn't that nice? (laughs) <laughs> we're me- individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Having gifts that differ. Now, I know spiritual gifts differ, talents, and uh, environment, heredity, education, training, experience, all of that differs. There are no two people alike in this room. God has really made a diverse bunch of people gather together in one place, hasn't He? That's His plan. He does, he's not into clones. He loves individuality. Any of you that have five kids, six kids, three kids, ten kids, none of them are the same. And it's the same with God's family. Each one of us are individuals before Him. But then He puts us in a family He doesn't want the solitary to be left out. He connects us with cords of love. There's in Ephesians 4, it talks about being knit together in the body. The knitting together is is a tough thing to explain, but I know that it's real. I know that I felt that knitting together with Tony when I first began to meet him. And uh, it's very rare to me to say to another man, I love you. And I said that to him before I ever really had spent a lot of time with him. But something of God in me, something of Christ in me, love the Christ in him. We need to be, we need to dare to love each other. Warts and all. We need to love each other in time opinions and viewpoints and all. It doesn't matter what your end time viewpoint is, we still have the same job to do. And when he comes back, we'll all go up regardless of your theology about it. The issue is, do you belong to him? Have you been born of the Spirit? He knows who are his, and we're all going with him when he comes back. We're going to be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. You won't have time to debate, but Jesus, you're coming at the wrong time according to my chart. Oops, God made a mistake. He didn't check with your chart first. (laughs) The issue is, will when he comes back, will he find faith on the earth? That's the issue. And I can tell whether or not you've got faith, and you ought to know too. Faith will cause you to seek God. Faith will cause you to pray. Faith will lead you to read the Bible and inquire of the Lord and to search after things. Faith will lead you to seek earnestly the best gifts of the Holy Spirit, prophecy being one of those. Faith will seek you to have transrational spiritual experiences such as the baptism in the Holy Spirit with speaking in unknown tongues. I mean, in in Acts chapter 8, 
the evangelist was leading people to be baptized and confess Jesus as Lord, and the whole city was getting saved, and there was great joy. But somehow the apostles in Jerusalem thought those believers are deficient because the Holy Spirit is not falling on them. And they went there and prayed for them and saw the Holy Spirit falling on those believers. They knew it when it happened. And I just want to tell you, it's a transrational, supernatural experience that will help you. The spirit of faith can lead you into the gift of faith. How many of you understand this? And I'll close with this thought. The Holy Spirit has all the faith you need. And the gift of faith occurs when you before God are yielded and the Holy Spirit knows you're stepping in with courage, boldness, you're stepping into a situation by prayer, petition, or circumstance that's over your head and you need something you don't have in your portfolio. You need you need to be able to pull out your wallet or open up your purse or get your credit card or debit card and get something you don't have the capacity to obtain or the credit line to obtain. But Jesus loans you his credit card called faith. And with his credit card, you put a down payment on something that God wants you to have or to do that you could not have done if he hadn't loaned you his credit card. The Holy Spirit has the gift of faith and he will loan it to you if you ask him to. When that gift of faith is operating, it doesn't matter whether people are believing or not in those situations. All that matters is one man, one woman said, I believe God, and here I stand. And heaven and earth shift toward kingdom purpose. The worlds, the ages are framed by the Word of God. When the Word is believed, spoken, received, and acted on, it shifts things. I don't care that Walmart's building a brand new corporate headquarters here. I don't care that their upper policy management and advertising promotions have promoted transgender chaos and nonsense with their artwork and their, their destitute bankrupt morality. God says, Walmart belongs to me. They're not building it for them. They're building it for me. And God says, I can populate it with spirit-filled, born-again, Bible-believing Christians, and they will take the influence of righteousness as well as meet the needs of hungry people around the world. God doesn't think like we think. Isaiah 55 says, His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. We're limited in our perspective. God's God. Let Him be God. Let the Spirit of faith begin to operate in your life. Back to our text where he said, according to the Scripture, we believe, therefore we speak. Let your mouth begin to direct your life by speaking the Word that God gives to you. Let faith begin to cause a path to be opened before you where you thought there was no way through. Would you bow your head with me just for a moment? As you bow your head, I want you to ask yourself, do I want the Lord to give to me the spirit of faith? Do I want to have greater faith, even if it requires that I humble my heart before God, that I confess my weakness and call on Him for grace? Do I want the Lord to do in my life things that are beyond what I can think or imagine? Then I need greater faith. 
I need greater faith to forgive those that have trespassed against me and to believe for promises that are way over my head. I need greater faith. Will you, while your head is bowed, quietly ask the Lord, Lord, increase my faith. Lord, would you give to me the spirit of faith? Lord, would you open my eyes to see what you see? Open my ears to hear what you hear so that I can believe your word the way you believe your own word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, we as a church, would you stand with me and let's pray this prayer together. Let's just stand in agreement as I pray this prayer over us. Father, we as a church come together now as a congregation as one body of believers assembled with leaders and members that you have assigned. And we say, Lord, increase our corporate faith. Would you pray that prayer with me? Lord, increase our corporate faith. Father, give us an anointing to believe for the redemption of our children, for the salvation and transformation of a spouse, for the recruiting and addition and equipping of laborers in the next generation. Let your faith carry us into our promised land. In the name of Jesus Christ, and everybody together say amen. amen. Thank you. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you for being here today.